Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I'm delighted to have Mark uh, Salman and Peter Berkman back. So we're gonna be talking today about Marshall McLuhan. Uh, he's a profound thinker. He's a profound philosopher that some people have heard of, but only at a very superficial level. So we are going to start by doing a Marshall McLuhan 101. And then we're going to have Peter talk about the paper that he has written on Marshall McLuhan and the inner census. All right, so welcome, Mark and Peter. Hello, Shrikan. Thanks for having us. Uh, Shrikan, I have to begin, of course, with uh, what an uh, incredible um, blessing, in fact, it has been uh, to have met you and your friend. Um, this is an a absolutely remarkable uh, thing you put together, which, of course, would not have happened without COVID. So uh, I will also have to thank COVID, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, that's a joke. Um, in addition to myself and Peter, um, uh, Adam Bartley and Adam Pugin and Bill Frezza are also on this call. Um, all of us are involved with the Center for the Study of Digital Life, which is an organization that began um, in a kind of a stealth mode in 2015, we're now in the process of becoming much better known. Uh, so a year from now, there will probably be some nasty stories about us. No, again, just, just <laughs> there'll be some stories, or at least some, what the hell are these guys are doing? So uh, my very brief introduction here will be to simply point to something beyond what we're gonna talk about today. I won't motivate this uh, uh, much more. Uh, we'll be uh, doing um, uh, a drill down next week, uh, same time. And, and I think uh, maybe this will, will come up, but um, some of you probably have been fascinated with uh, postmodern uh, thought. And uh, you may even have uh, fallen down Alice's rabbit hole on uh, Foucault or uh, Lacan or uh, Deleuze, or uh, you name it. <clears throat> I want to try to um, just stimulate your interest. Um, at the moment, there's nothing to be done with this other than your interest. But I have just come across a remarkable book. The title of this book is The Question Concerning Technology in China. Now, if, if you've been Following the, the whole postmodern world, particularly as it intersects technology, you will know that, that uh, Martin Heidegger um, wrote a very uh, significant essay uh, in the 50s uh, called The Question Concerning Technology. It wasn't translated into English until 1976. This is a Chinese student of uh, Bernard. Siegler, who was a student of Derrida. So this is third generation in that world, but he's bringing China into the whole topic, which means a whole lot to us. I don't underline, I dog ear. I have never read a book with nearly every page dog ear. So uh, at some point, I'm gonna to try to figure out with uh, Trikan's help, how to do a deep dive on this. But here's the punchline. As fascinating as this is, it does not have faculty psychology. And what you're going to hear from Peter today is how, Marsh, how far Marshall McLuhan could take his understanding also lacking faculty psychology. And so the question I'm posing here is what would the 20th century have been like? if we didn't have to rely upon Carl Jung, Jordan Peterson, and a whole series of other people who did not have faculty psychology. And you're about to hear from Peter how far McLuhan could take it. Now we can take all of this much further. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Mark. So we're going to do this in two parts. The first one is going, first part, first half is going to be Marshall McLuhan 101. And second will be, uh, you know, looking at Peter's work. So on Marshall McLuhan, so I, Mark, can I start with you first? Sure. 
Okay. So tell me about first first question. When did you discover Marshall McLuhan? I'm 73 years old. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin Madison in in 1970. Marshall McLuhan was a very big deal in the 1960s. Uh, published Gutenberg Galaxy in 62, Understanding Media in 64. Uh, the Medium is the Massage was published with his name, even though he didn't write it, uh, in 67. So when I was an undergraduate, McLuhan was very much in the air. And that's when I discovered him, when he was first popular. Uh, so what, I mean, I'm going to ask a very large question. What is the significance of Marshall McLuhan for somebody trying to understand the world today? I did not know it at the time, but I was a very curious undergraduate trying to make a decision between biology and physics. And it turned out that McLuhan was supplying the underlying understanding of causality. I could not have possibly formulated it at the time, it turned out later on that his son, Eric, uh, who became a friend of mine in 2005, went out of his way to try to make sure that everybody understood that his father was all about formal cause. You would not have discovered that by reading the early McLuhan. Those words were not used. But the answer to your question, Srikant, is only something I discovered much later, which is, if you wish to understand the world in which we live, you must have a robust understanding of causality. And the most robust form of causality is provided by Marshall McLuhan in the 20th century. It's another one of these topics that everybody walks around the swimming pool, but nobody gets on the diving board. Uh, McLuhan actually dove into the water but he had to wear those little wings uh, to keep him uh, supported in the water. Um, and so the real importance of McLuhan is that he brings people in the 20th century, um, many centuries after it had been deliberately forgotten, back to a medieval understanding of formal cause. Okay, um, so I want to make this accessible to everybody because what has happened is that you know, of the four causes of Aristotle, people, you know, today, like the, not people today, but kind of the intellectuals today, and then the people today are focused mostly on the efficient and material causes. They are kind of at the periphery aware of what final cause may mean, but formal, formal cause is far away. So it is a significant distance for people to cover in order for them to grasp what formal cause is and how Marshall McLuhan employs it. So I want to go a little bit step by step so people can get, get the intermediate steps. So let me ask a simpler questions first then. So Marshall McLuhan talks about media and what media does for us. And the center talks about these multiple stages. One thing, one thinker that all of us here are very familiar with because because we've been doing lots of meetups, like almost six meetups on that is Julian James. Right. And he makes a very crucial point, a very fundamental point about how a person, you know, how a person's thinking or a society's thinking changes. And there are these stages of cultural evolution. And he talks about kind of the initial transformations. Um, so first let's start by saying, what is it that Julian Jaynes does and how is his thought related to Marshall McLuhan? Right. Um, I've, I've mentioned before that uh, sort of by um, accident, I became Julian Jaynes' uh, final student, which is to say I, I spent uh, four days with him uh, a couple of months before he died at his ancestral home on Prince Edward Island uh, uh, up uh, Northeast Canada. <clears throat> What Julian James told me that weekend was that if he had it all to do over again, he would have featured Marshall McLuhan. Hmm. This came, hmm. I didn't prompt him on this, 
this, this was not, at the point that this happened, I was not in any way identified publicly with McLuhan. It was not something that I brought up. It wasn't until 1998, after James had died, that I returned aggressively um, at a conference held by NYU in New York, Legacy of Mark McLuhan. So unprompted, he said, if I had it all to do over again, I would base it on the work of Marshall McLuhan. I would not have focused on uh, the people of the seas and volcanic interruptions or other possible explanations. He said, Mark, it's just the alphabet. That, that's all it is. So the Julian James work is about the change of forms. In particular, the change from an oral to a literate or what we call scribal society. This is uh, the most uh, extreme example, probably in all human history, of how the changes in forms of communication alters society completely. And so the study for the center of digital life is specifically to study how the form of digital, that's to say, what, are, what is the architecture? What is the structure? What, what are these machines? How are they built? And what does that structure form do to us? It is our belief that we are now going through a transition which has many uh, uh, an analogous uh, parallels to what James talks about. So James, as far as I'm concerned, is a absolutely mandatory prerequisite to understand today's effects of digital technology. Wonderful. So I, how about this? Let's look at the, all the stages, you know, the, the distinction between the oral and scribal stage we have looked at with James. Right. Right. So right. we can quickly recap that and then talk about all these sensibilities. You know, what is the oral sensibility? What is a scribal sensibility? What is a print sensibility? What is a, uh, electric sensibility and what is the digital sensibility. And then we will bring in McLuhan as and when needed and Jane's as and when needed, because then people will get a sense of all these sensibilities. So how is, um, let's start with oral versus scribal. What is the oral sensibility and what is a scribal sensibility? I would say if people have not read this, you, you, you've had um, Brian McVeigh on uh, one of your meetups or multiple meetups, I think. And uh, it may be that people have had a chance to read his um, psychology in the Bible. Uh, what the thing is that they're going to be very familiar with Jane's idea. So what I'm trying to do is that uh -huh. I'm trying to anchor their understanding in this distinction between oral and scribal right. so that they can understand the distinction between electric and digital, because digital it, is hard to understand because we are in the middle of the transition. Right. The, right. The electric is hard to understand because we grew up with it. We kind of take it for granted. Right. What this does is that it gives you an outside point from right. which to view this progression. So that's what I'm trying to do. We, so we, even we, if people have heard right. of it, I want to recap it and then extend it. Okay. Well, very briefly, um, um, the pre-literate or oral world did not rely on externalized memory. So the human memory, um, which is a faculty of the human soul, did not have written materials. Yes, indeed, there were commercial um, receipts uh, pressed into clay with uh, uh, cuneiform. Uh, I grew up in my father's library. By the age of 10, I could play around with and pretend I could write in cuneiform. Um, yes, that existed, but a literate population didn't exist. The, the paintings on the temple walls in the pyramid were not intended for any human being to uh, read. In fact, the artists, uh, many presume, were actually killed and, uh, and buried in the, in the temple. These were intended for gods to read. So the development of a literate audience as occurred um, uh, with the Hebrews, certainly, 
particularly after the Babylonian captivity, as occurred certainly in uh, 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 Athens, as was generally described as the Axial Age um, by Carl Jaspers. This was a, a absolutely amazing transition. We can focus on hallucinated voices. We can focus on um, uh, self-aware consciousness, all, all these names. But in, in fact, what happened is that society was radically transformed in many places around the world simultaneously. So Buddha didn't write anything. Jesus didn't write anything. Konza, Confucius didn't write anything. But their disciples in all those cases did. And this transition to um, sacred text is so fundamental in human society um, that it becomes the, the topic of Julian Jaynes and, and Merlin Donald, who you'll be hearing from. He'll have a lot to say about. Merlin Donald actually extends it backwards. Mm -hmm. So there are other stages before this transition, taking us through mimesis and, and so forth. What a um, number of people have done is to extend it closer to us. So the transition from a, a written uh, scribal, uh, the technical term is probably a chirographic, um, the transition from a world in which you've externalized your memory but you have to manually write it down to a kachunka, chunka, chunka uh, mechanical world. Mm -hmm. um, this is the transition that brought capitalism. It brought the enlightenment. Um, it brought uh, effectively the end of Christianity, even though it persisted. Uh, this is the world that brought us uh, industrial growth, that brought us colonialism. So that transition from scribal, none of those things I just described existed in the scribal world. Mm -hmm. All those social effects took place afterwards. Uh, Elizabeth Eisenstein's PhD thesis, the title of which doesn't roll off the top of my, uh, my head, but it's a, it's a wonderful, big, thick book. And we can uh, figure out how to get your copies if you want to know. She's probably the best at describing how radical that transformation, this is the transformation that uh, occurred um, in the centuries. Time scale is very important. It took centuries after Gutenberg. Um, it is the first major book that McLuhan wrote. And so Peter will tell you about Gutenberg Galaxy. Then we come to the transition from print to electric. And this one, should probably be familiar to you also. Um, the most obvious slogan from that transition is God is dead. Nietzsche's statement that God is dead is backed up by, by hundreds of other testimonies. Maybe most importantly, we have Max Weber, the father of sociology, who in one of his very last uh, lectures in a lecture titled Science as a Vocation, he declares that the world has become disenchanted. So the electric world, which you all grew up in, which many of the people we've studied, which basically Jung, Peterson, et cetera, are all trying, and Heidegger, and, and I don't know, and all these people are trying to somehow deal with that. That world has become disenchanted. And we got world wars as a result of that. Um, we got an, an enormous uh, confusion as a result of that. And now we're at a, a, a real crossroads. Um, if we don't go beyond electric, um, then, um, then we're electrocuted. Wonderful. So let's look at those three. Uh, in terms of sensibilities, you know, how, do, how do people actually function in right. scribal, print, and electric? What is the difference in terms of, you've talked about the change in systems, you know, like capitalism, um, change in ideas like, you know, God is dead. But in terms of how do people actually, how their consciousness works, how is it different from scribal to print to electric? Um, Peter, I don't know. Do you, would you like to uh, try to tackle that question? Yeah, this might, might be a good time to tag in. So, sure, please sure. go ahead. Okay. Um, 
Yes. Yeah, so when we're talking about sensibilities, we're, we're talking about, you know, really the psychology of, of the individuals in society. So as they relate to each other. So whatever that dominant uh, technological analogy is for that society becomes really how people relate to one another. Um, we might look at today's configuration where you're all in a mosaic of mm -hmm. uh, pixels on you know, these retina displays on, on your MacBooks. This is different, significantly different than um, a radio show, mm -hmm. right? Where you would have to call in to an invisible man mm -hmm. and then there'd be a switchboard. Uh, so there are differences here uh, in, in the program which is uh, really not a program, but an environment, which, uh, and the difference being that we don't know the boundaries of it since we're breathing it. Um, and so at, at the heart of McLuhan is really uh, this uh, premise that human knowledge uh, is really imperfect, that we never really know the boundaries of any situation that we are in and are left to the mercy of uh, whatever understanding we can glean from it. And uh, people are always devising new techniques to uh, get themselves out of that trap. And in the process, creating new boundaries, <laughs> which then need to be understood. So uh, you wanna get out of the print trap? Okay, well, we accidentally made electricity, which changes everything. So mm -hmm. you're not only gonna have people in this new situation, you're gonna have people who imagine they're in the old situation for probably another couple hundred years, right? And so oh. that's, that's what winds up happening. People live in an electric world uh, with the print sensibility. And so McLuhan simplified this formulation and said, you know, we see the, the present through a rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, but at the same time, that's not to say that we're hopeless. Um, you know, the title of his book, his really breakout book, Understanding Media is really the, uh, the prescription that he writes metaphysically, that we can actually understand these things if we study them. And so uh, what Mark is doing as the president of the Center for the Study of Digital Life, a lot of people leave off the study, mm -hmm. uh, is, is really a probe to, uh, to encourage us to not only study the architecture of the digital technology itself, but to also study it as an environment, a social environment, uh, a matrix in which human activity takes place. And not only that, but to also study its effects on us as individuals. And so that's where psychology comes in and where my own interest in McLuhan uh, comes in in particular. So uh, I, I guess to answer your question, uh, these sensibilities, you know, they, they, they change a lot depending on uh, whether you have a world dominated by handwriting, which we're calling scribal, um, and the authority that is lent by not only the handwriting, but a public that, well, I actually hesitate to say public, but I'd say rather a, uh, a network of literate uh, authoritative structures that bring that um, writing into action. And that's really the, the medieval world that, that we're talking about. Um, in fact, McLuhan liked to say that the printed book made a public for the first time. Mm -hmm. It made a public for an mm -hmm. author to want to bounce off of. And so Peter, Peter, have, this is fantastic. This is fantastic. So let's 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 kind of zoom in on a few things. Sure. So uh, it, it, this is just brilliant. Okay. Um, so let's step one step back. So let's talk about the oral culture and the sensibilities of oral culture. Uh, as far as I can see, in oral culture, everybody is around you, and you're just talking. It's a small group of people, and you're just talking amongst each other. Whereas in scribal culture, you have you know, these learned people who are learning and many times they will not themselves speak, but somebody writes it down and it has a certain kind of sacredness about that writing because it captures a lot of wisdom in one place. Um, so right. uh, so how, how would you, so let's, let, because if we, can, if we can communicate the difference between sensibilities, between the oral and the scribal and print, and then point to electric, I think people will have people will have a sense of what these sensibilities mean because that is the hardest thing to understand. Like when I was trying right. to understand Jane's, to try to see what does a bicameral mind look like, you know, what it, because it is so foreign. But then once you actually see grasp that in its native uh, surroundings, then you can see echoes of it 
happening now as well. So let's start with, uh, sure. if you want scribal or oral, whichever one you prefer. Well, I, I think I would start by saying this, that, um, you know, one of the, the real maxims here is that we are, we become what we behold. So mm -hmm. the technology that we use in a certain way, we acclimate to, we mimic, mm -hmm. we imitate its patterns. So um, you're speaking of, for instance, in the scribal instance, you have uh, Plato writing down dialogues, spoken dialogues between Socrates and his interlocutors. In the same way, you have uh, Christ speaking to people. The only line he ever wrote was in the sand, but mm -hmm. uh, you still have him reading the Hebrew text, and then you have his disciples uh, writing uh, words that he had said as best they could remember uh, through whatever inspiration had. Um, in the same way, uh, Mark is talking about uh, the, the Buddhist text. And so um, think about the, uh, the actual structure of that, because that's the key that McLuhan uses into this sensibility. So um, let's start with Plato. Um, Socrates, when he's speaking to anybody, whether it's uh, Cratylus or whoever, um, there's no letters flying around anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, there is sounds that are repeated um, and, and brought back, but the fact that writing is in the mix at all changes everything. Suddenly you have uh, the, the sort of uh, the chief novelty of the platonic dialogue is the, could you repeat that? Could you say that again? Mm -hmm. So suddenly mm -hmm. you have this replay that's mm -hmm. able to happen in multiple mm -hmm. dialogues, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what did you mean when you said this? Mm -hmm. This is not something that ever happens in an oral society. What did you mean mm -hmm. by that? <laughs> what is the meaning of this? Right. Uh, you might imagine like a professor with sunglasses or with, with glasses <laughs> saying, what, what is all this thing? You know, that, that never happened. Uh, so the, the oral world is really a world of slang. Uh, sensibly, it's a world of the ear. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. world of resonance, a world mm -hmm. dominated uh, by this embodied uh, memory, which is really quite indistinct from the sensible imagination uh and but but suddenly so, so meaning uh the sign is never really erased from or separated divorced from it, its action in the world mm -hmm. um suddenly you introduce letters specifically phonetic alphabet the abcs don't mean anything at all except for an implied understanding of the, of the phonetic component abaka it means nothing. And McLuhan mm -hmm. insisted this mm -hmm. always. So you have a meaningless container that is only given meaning uh, when it is arranged in, in certain ways that resonate with the way people speak. But again, you need a literate person mm -hmm. and multiple literate people if that has any action in the world. So I, I would say for McLuhan, just to make this a bit more McLuhan mm -hmm. 101, mm -hmm. this is an understanding that McLuhan got from his studies at Cambridge uh, with the new critics, people like F.R. Levis, Empson, that whole crew. Um, but he went much further than any of they did uh, because what they did, they, they um, would look at poems and they wouldn't say, is this a good poem? Is this a bad poem? Uh, what does this poem mean? They, they, they would get away from that. They would say, what is the effect that this poem has? Mm -hmm. And so McLuhan considered himself as being concerned with effects. And he's, he thought, well, if we can do this with a poem, we could do this with anything. <laughs> we could look at the effects of anything um, as being a sort of invisible cause in a way. And so I actually have this book next to me. This is a, a book he wrote called City as Classroom, mm -hmm. 1977, hmm. where he proposes that uh, for a new curriculum, you get three or five kids in, in little teams to actually go out into the culture and ask questions. So to study the environment mm -hmm. uh, and then to go back into the classroom, which doesn't have the answers, but is where the questions can be discussed. So this is his sort of inverted approach uh, of, of this sort of effects before causes thing. So uh, you could look at print in the same way. Mm -hmm. You could say, well, what did print mean? You could say, um, well, it gave us Shakespeare. It gave us, you know, factories. And, but McLuhan would say, that's the content of it. It's not, it's not the, uh, the effect. 
and what the effect is remains hidden. And so uh, Mark mentioned, I, I would bring up the Gutenberg galaxy and that, that's really uh, where McLuhan gets into the print environment. That book uh, is subtitled, so it's the Gutenberg galaxy colon, the making of typographic man. So uh, McLuhan would say that that typographic sensibility um, which again, McLuhan is always uh, sorry in, if I'm rambling, but no, this is this is beautiful. Just just continue to ramble, please. So it always comes back to the senses for mm -hmm. McLuhan, and uh, this is something that most people don't know. But his uh, insistence on returning to the senses as the source of anything understood um, comes from his study of Saint Thomas Aquinas, specifically. Uh, through James Joyce, but also mediated by a few mentors, which I, I write about in, in my essay, um, which we can talk about later. So if you want to understand the print world, you sort of have to retrace the stages of apprehension, uh, so to speak, as, as he would quote Joyce. Um, so when you read Shakespeare, King Lear, talking about a kingdom divided, um, McLuhan is saying, uh, uh, sorry, I, sh I should qualify this because Mark said that McLuhan was uh, on the right train, <laughs> but maybe got off at the wrong station. So uh, I would say faculty psychology is what James Joyce was dealing with, is what uh, McLuhan's mentors were dealing with, but they were dealing with an impaired version of faculty psychology, which negated probably the most important components of it, which are what happens in the brain once the external senses are transformed into something understood. So uh, McLuhan's studies, as I will talk about in the essay, mm -hmm. as we discuss it, were really limited to the external senses. And uh, there's much, much more work to be done now that uh, as we've been talking about interior senses, uh, the four that we laid out last week, the common sense, uh, which McLuhan actually does talk about, the census communis, mm -hmm. Uh, the imaginative faculty, the cogitative faculty, and the memorative faculty, when those are brought to bear on all the insights that McLuhan had in the 20th century, uh, we will be in a, uh, in a place where we really haven't been since the Middle Ages, scientifically and psychologically speaking. Wonderful. So, uh, Peter, you said you discovered McLuhan around five years ago, independent of Marx. So tell me about that. How did you discover okay. that? So actually, I first discovered McLuhan about now 12 years ago. Ah, <laughs> so I'm, I'm 32, mm -hmm. um, and I was studying music technology at NYU um, in 2008. So I actually, I'm a professional musician. I play in a band called Anamanaguchi. I'm a mm -hmm. digital musician. Mm -hmm. And so I went to NYU studying uh, music technology, right? And so NYU, you get a basic liberal arts education to go along with it. And so one of the classes that we had to take was called Performing Arts in Western Civilization. And the professor uh, was Dr. Tom McFarlane, who had been uh, put there by the chair of the music department, Dr. Lawrence Ferrara, a prominent uh, copyright lawyer, intellectual property lawyer, who was uh, famous for dealing with, you know, the legal implications of, uh, of sampling for instance. Mm -hmm. So Tom McFarlane um, was a professor who brought McLuhan to bear on uh, Dr. Ferrara's dissertation on uh, a really new music theory that allowed things beyond just the mere composition to be brought up in court. So you wouldn't just bring sheet music to talk mm -hmm. about public enemy, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you'd have to bring the whole weight of the, the cultural mm -hmm. context in order to say that's taken mm -hmm. or that's mm -hmm. not taken and it's fair use. Mm -hmm. So um, McFarlane brought McLuhan to bear on that and then uh, was at the music department teaching this course, uh, which uh, I took in 2008 and was basically a sort of phenomenology thing. So mm -hmm. we learned about Heidegger. We learned about, um, you know, uh, actually even Wittgenstein mm -hmm. and some others. And, and I actually thought Wittgenstein was very interesting. Heidegger bored mm -hmm. me to death, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but I actually got into a really heated debate with Professor McFarlane when McLuhan came up. Hmm. I think uh, McFarlane was showing us uh, the Beatles music video for Penny Lane. Hmm. And uh, if no one here has seen it, uh, it's 
basically, I guess they go back to Liverpool and uh, you have the mailman, you have mm -hmm. the, the crossing guard and you mm -hmm. have all these neighborhood figures. And then McFarlane goes, this is the global village. This is just as McLuhan had said it and the world had become one. And then he showed us the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and the screaming audience. And he goes, the audience knew that they were part of a happening and they knew that they were in on the action and something really big was happening. They understood what was happening. And we're sitting here at NYU in 2008, in the middle of a financial crisis, uh, in a very contested presidential campaign, um, where you have people like you know Ron Paul, like people mm -hmm. my age, mm -hmm. who are on Reddit, dreaming up Bitcoin at this time, you know, and uh, and I just raised my hand. And I said, Professor, the way that you're talking about McLuhan, this this seems dangerous to me. Mm -hmm. And he recoiled and he said, dangerous. What do you mean mm -hmm. dangerous? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I think, I don't know if that audience understood what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we understand what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and yet McLuhan stayed with me for a while. I, I didn't read much, but uh, for anyone, uh, Elon Musk loves McLuhan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he understands McLuhan, but he loves McLuhan. Elon Musk's favorite video game is called Deus Ex, mm -hmm. which means, you know, God from, short for Deus Ex Machina, God from the machine. So I was actually playing that game, Deus Ex, um, when I went to Toronto. So uh, I, my band, I dropped out of NYU. So this is sort of a long story, but mm -hmm. dropped out of NYU and uh, made a video game soundtrack with my band for this mm -hmm. thing called Scott Pilgrim versus the World. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my trip to Toronto, I was talking with a friend about this game Deus Ex mm -hmm. and about all the implications that it has about technology and there's human augmentations, there's a man that becomes a robot, there's a robot that becomes a man, all these things. And the guy said, you should really read Marshall McLuhan. Mm -hmm. And I said, interesting. Mm -hmm. And then he'd keep coming back. Everyone that I would be interacting with in my art at the highest level, when I have the deepest questions, they'd say, well, you know, McLuhan had something to say about that. And uh, in 2016, I was making another video game mm -hmm. and my friend Andrew Strasser said, you really got to read McLuhan. That's how he talked. And so I actually said, you know what? I actually am going to read a book. <laughs> and I went on Amazon and I bought, I think a copy of Understanding Media, but I also bought a copy of Marshall McLuhan's dissertation. And that is called The Classical Trivium, The Place of Thomas Nash in the Learning of His Time. So. Shortly after, and I should say, his, his dissertation is really a catalog of the history of Western civilization's education from Plato up through the printing press. And pretty soon, I mean, if you look at my Amazon shopping history, it, <laughs> Jeff Bezos was very happy because I bought nothing from 2011 to 2016. In 2016, I bought probably 200 books and then I learned how to, I met Mark and then my temper slowed down and about a hundred and I bought 50 <laughs> and now I, I, I pirate books wonderfully. No, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> so, uh, but no, it was reading that dissertation uh, where, you know, I wanted to get to the bottom of it. Right. And so um, the dissertation seemed to be a great place to start. I got about halfway through when uh, I found Mark online because he seemed to me not, not to knock anybody, but a lot of people write about Marshall McLuhan. Um, and let's, we should maybe get a bit more into the 101. Mm -hmm. the, he's famous, the man is world famous technology guy. Like I said, Elon Musk loves mm -hmm. Marshall McLuhan. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk is the richest man in the world. Um, and McLuhan, you know, is in Annie Hall. He's mm -hmm. the guy that they pull in from the side. Yes. And Annie Hall won best picture in 1977, not Star Wars. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's a world famous man. But um, as you said, he's not given his right place. And so for me, I was like, part of my French, I said, holy shit, this guy that I learned about in 2008 as the Beatles guy is is really not the Beatles guy. He's he's really somebody else. He's uh, so much deeper. And so um, I was really looking for someone who could and not only that but he was really pointing to a lot of the tensions that I found in the world. You know, uh, a lot of people would talk about 
things like the technological singularity, right? That we would all upload our brains to the internet and live forever. This was big in, in 2008. Kurzweil had written his Age of Spiritual Machines. Wired Magazine was writing articles. And then you have McLuhan talking about uh, the basis of this, Pierre Teilhard du Chardin. And he'd say, I'm not a fan of Pierre Teilhard du Chardin. The idea that anything is better because it comes later is surely borrowed from pre-electronic technologies. <laughs> and he says, the idea of a cosmic thrust in one direction is surely the lamest semantic fallacies ever bred by the word evolution. That development should have any direction at all is inconceivable except to the highly literate community. And so this whole premise of a new sphere, of an intellectual world um, that we make that will immortalize us is just totally cut down by McLuhan effortlessly. And then he gets to talk about the full depth of the situation or point, point to it at least. And I wouldn't even say depth, I'd say he's talking about the contours and the shape, the form of, of these particular environments which aren't drawn in a straight line or even an exponential curve. And so um, Mark Stallman uh, got to that route and there were many others who didn't. And um, I decided that I would uh, reach out to Mark, not only because uh, of that, but because earlier that year I had reached out to Doug Rushkoff, who was also a sort of McLuhan guy. and. Uh, I found out was also a fellow at Mark Center. So I said, I'm going to uh, meet Mark Stallman. I'm halfway through my uh, McLuhan dissertation, reading it, annotating every page. Cause like McLuhan, uh, he would write in the margins of all of his printed books. He had no respect for the, for the printed, uh, printed letter over his own noodle mm -hmm. and ability to understand it. So it's, it's a Scrabble activity too. Right. He'd make his own indexes in the back of, of books that he read. In fact, his library is now a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site because of that. No, I, I, I do that, too. I think that's the best way of respecting a printed book. There that's you go. Actually, you're, <laughs> there you you're go. actually reading the book. I can't right. read a book without a pen in my hand. It's impossible exactly. for me. So yes. maybe it is respect. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yes. think, I think you're right about that. It's, uh, it's, it was, makes it a sort of living document instead of just a fossil on the, uh, on the shelf. Yes, because you're, you're basically treating that product as a product of a human mind and you are trying to grasp it in your own way. Right. Um, and what, what more, what better compliment you can pay an author that you are doing all the work. There is a book where I like- It goes to, to the YouTube books. comments here, by the way. Yeah. Like What's in that? Subscribe. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes, uh, go, go on. So uh, you, you're, you're talking about the, go, going through the dissertation. Oh yeah, so then, yeah. I, I, I even drew little figures. So anytime uh, McLuhan would mention, uh, you know, Jean Gerson, I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna draw <laughs> Professor Jean Gerson <laughs> and, uh, mm. and write the date that he died, the date that he was born uh, mm. and all these things. And um, draw a little- Jean portrait. Gerson was a rector at the University of Paris, which is a very important uh, intersection in That's all right. of this. That, that, I'd, I'd love to see the drawing you made of uh, this uh, Aristotelian logician. So, so uh, Mark and I met at the fountain in Bryant Park in New York City, uh, right by the New York Public Library. Uh, I was actually living at my parents at the time. Uh, my dad is here in the Zoom. Hello, dad. Uh, he's the big E for Edward. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I took the train in and Mark and I spoke not only about this dissertation, um, which he had a lot to say about, uh, but we also spoke about uh, what was going on in my life, which uh, I was playing uh, a Japanese video game called Bloodborne, which seemed to me covered a lot of the same themes in an abstract artistic sort of way. And so we, uh, we started at the Bryant Park Fountain, New York Public Library, and we, we ended eating uh, Japanese ramen noodles. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, talking about Sony and, and lots of things. So uh, when it came to the dissertation though, uh, I was expecting Mark to say, you know, uh, great, now do this or whatever. And, and instead, the first thing he said is, you know, he didn't write that, right? I was like, what are you talking about? And of course, Mark is probing, but I said, what, what the hell are you talking about? Of course he wrote this. I've read McLuhan, I, I, this is Marshall. And he said, uh, I was like, yeah, he wrote this at Cambridge. He said, no, he didn't write it at Cambridge. It's a Cambridge dissertation, but he actually wrote it at St. Louis with his friend, Bernard J. Mueller-Time, 
who was a student at, at Dion Gilson. I was like, okay, what, what the hell's going on here? So Mark uh, had, had a knowledge that exceeded my expectations and pushed me to actually study these things a bit more closely. And so, you know, the next week I actually went to SLU's library online and discovered that in fact, Bernard J. Mueller Times class notes were available, including his class notes from 1939, 1940, 1941, when uh, this dissertation was being made. And so reading the handwritten notes, it covers the same historical period. And it's sure as shit that McLuhan did not get Jean Garçon or Modi Significandi or any of these other aspects from Cambridge. He got them from the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies via Gilson uh, and, and Mueller Times. So that is what Mark uh, meant by that mm -hmm. statement, mm -hmm. that it was a collaborative effort. That, like all knowledge is a collaborative effort. Nobody understands alone. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's fascinating. Uh, so and that was five years ago when mm -hmm. we first met. And since then I've been uh, studying and I think the fruit of that work is this essay, this uh, little PDF file that anyone can uh, now look at. Wonderful. So Peter, let's... Peter discovered that, that he was an archivist and a scholar in, <laughs> in this process. So, so we, we've got this um, musician, uh, talented musician, um, uh, video game connections and so forth. But in the process, uh, he discovered the scholarship angle and, and his <laughs> own, um, uh, this stuff didn't bore him. And, oh, and very exciting. And in, in fact, the very first uh, thing that Peter did is he went to the Rockefeller and Ford Foundation archives in Sleepy Hollow. That's right. And to, uh, to get to the start of McLuhan's career, where he had uh, his first grant in 1953. And, Sorry, and, Mark, I didn't mean to interrupt. And, and, and beyond. No, uh, uh, Peter, Peter's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And he, and he has a talent that um, uh, he, he just told you he didn't buy a single book for multiple years. And and now then all of a sudden he he become, he is the world's leading scholar I believe on McLuhan and many other critical figures now, and that that was always there, in Peter I didn't uh, um, uh, slip something into his, uh, <laughs> into his coffee uh, or something, but in the process of doing so the this, coffee does help and I have one with me now. So. <laughs> in the process of doing this, Peter learned a great deal about himself. Uh, and uh, as we all are doing here now, and we all have a lot more to discover, but uh, it, it's been an, an enormous uh, honor and pleasure to be able to work with Peter for the last five years. Wonderful. Thanks so well. now let's get to your essay, Peter. So t tell me about the essay. What, what, why did you choose to write this essay? Why, what, what is the significance of it? Well, I chose to write this essay back to the oral scribal thing because I'd, I'd gotten... Uh, my speech had crystallized into something that needed to be written down. <laughs> I found myself saying the same thing over and over again uh, and being like, wow, wouldn't it be great to, to write that down and uh, have it organized? And uh, it actually took a really long time to translate uh, mm -hmm. from something in my head to something I'd, I'd feel comfortable written down. Because um, when you start writing sentences, suddenly word order becomes important. The audience becomes important. So you can have a conversation with anybody, really, if they speak mm -hmm. the same language and have some reference points. I can speak to 50 disembodied mosaics here, but mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to writing something, it, it's a bit more intimidating. And I, uh, a lot of the nuance is eliminated and then you really have to say, you know, what is, uh, what really happened here? And so part, part of this was a, a historical thing a historical exercise in uh, writing my view of uh, how McLuhan and his thought uh, changed over the years and specifically as it relates to a larger project within the Catholic Church to revive uh, St. Thomas Aquinas um, as the sort of seat of science. And so it was my initiative uh, to portray McLuhan as, uh, as far as it relates to science, you might ask, 
Was he an anthropologist? Was he a futurist? Was, was he, what, what ologist was he? And I think uh, since he's dealing with technologies as extensions of man that reshape uh, our sensibilities and our social relations, that that's the work of psychology. And that's where he intersects with St. Thomas Aquinas most in relying on insights to uh, understand the world. And so uh, this essay, the McLuhan's plural and the inner senses talks about, uh, you know, McLuhan from the start uh, of his career up to the end of his career, which is the end of his life um, as his son, Eric, uh, continues on the legacy uh, in a book called Laws of Media and other essays. Um, and also now how uh, Andrew McLuhan, uh, who is a wonderfully living 30 something uh, McLuhan, mm -hmm. son of Eric is still carrying on the mantle today. So, um, but yes, yeah, so it, it was really to frame McLuhan in this uh, continuity of faculty psychology, which uh, Mark mentioned earlier in, in the talk. and. Uh, that is characterized by Aquinas's interpretation of Aristotle. And if you don't have that, if you eliminate that from the picture of McLuhan, uh, you simply don't have McLuhan. It's an essential feature to his study. That's, that's really fascinating. And, and the thing that I noticed when, because, you know, I discovered McLuhan thanks to Bill, who showed up here on my meetup <laughs> less than four weeks ago. And so it's been like, it's been amazing four weeks, you know, uh, of, you know, picking up things. Uh, the thing that I found, and then I started reading Understanding Media, and um, I have the, the Trivium too, um, but I'm starting, started with Understanding Media, and I was stunned by the depth of each paragraph and each sentence in Understanding Media, of how many things it was <laughs> generating in my mind. Um, but but, then, tree, but yes. tree, he didn't write that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the classic Mark Probe. So he, he did actually have a very close collaborator who late in life claimed that he had written it and didn't get credit. It, 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 these things actually occurred. His name is Ted Carpenter, he's an anthropologist, but, but uh, no, Marshall McLuhan did write Understanding Media. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, the other thing that I noticed was that um, Marshall McLuhan was brilliant on television and he was able to communicate the points with such great charm, wit, depth, but he was talking to the audience, but it, there is clearly this entire substructure of thought that underlays what he's say, saying. Absolutely. He's never really discussed. It's That's just, exactly. you know, he's just talking this and you can see the impact of what he's talking. You say, wow, I never thought of that. But there is something this, so it looks like you and Mark and the center have been digging at that entire structure of saying, okay, this is what the structure is. Supporting That's right. That. Yeah, and it's that structure uh, is the soul. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what McLuhan is doing. Uh, he is stirring, not, he's not uh, telling you facts. He's stirring something within you. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the way that he says it here, and I like this a lot, I had not seen this before. Uh, I actually got this book from Andrew. Uh, this is out of print, mm -hmm. uh, City of His Classroom. City of His Classroom, number one, what you already know about your society. Hmm. So <laughs> McLuhan liked to say, by the time that a child learns English, they've already learned more than they will, or any language, they've learned more than they will learn in their entire lives about anything. Uh, because with the language that you learn, you inherit all of the etymological links, all of the structures, the historical psychological facts of associations, usages, the power uh, and sort of uh, you know, weight of each word and, and syllable, uh, how they've been used by people. Um, and uh, it, it far outweighs anything that you could possibly learn after that, or it would be rather subsidiary to it. 
And so McLuhan was a grammarian. He considered himself in that, you know, lineage of the trivium, grammar, logic, rhetoric. He thought grammar was the fuel. So uh, he would not uh, rely on logic for these things. He would, uh, in the same way that he would come, he's a Canadian, right? So he came to America in the 40s to, to teach students. And instead of saying, you know, here's Milton, here's Dante, let's get into it. He would say, here's Batman, here's Superman, here's what you already understand, or rather what you already relate with. And now let's try and understand it, pick it apart. Um, so yeah, he, he developed many techniques to, uh, to get at those things. But, um, but the real key uh, is, is what we're talking about here. I, mm -hmm. I think the faculty psychology mm -hmm. aspect, which uh, McLuhan um, understood to an extent, but uh, as, as Mark would say, uh, did not take uh, to the bank, <laughs> did not take all the way. So let's look at what part he did get. What, yes, what did he get uh, in terms of, of faculty psychology and what was the consequence of it in his, uh, on his ideas? So I would point to an essay that he wrote in 1951 uh, for uh, a little Catholic literary journal called Renaissance. Uh, and this is called Joyce Aquinas and the Poetic Process. Mm -hmm. um, so he talks about um, St. Thomas in relationship to, um, to Joyce. And uh, here, here is a quote. <clears throat> there, there's a whole section here, which, uh, which I have in my essay. Um, it talks about um, art and, and nature. Uh, so in Stephen Hero, I'm quoting McLuhan here. So there's a lot of nested quotes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be saying McLuhan, Joyce. Mm -hmm. McLuhan, it is in Stephen Hero that there are texts which explain what Joyce understood by a natural process. So art imitating nature. Um, so there's the phrase, right? Art is an imitation of nature. But Joyce said, Aristotle does not here define art. He says only art imitates nature and means that the artistic process is like the natural process. So McLuhan says that this process is that of ordinary apprehension is made plain. He says, for Stephen, uh, art was neither a copy nor an imitation of nature. The artistic process was a natural process, a veritably sub sublime process of one's own nature, which had a right to examination and open discussion. So then here's the, this made plain on page 212. What we symbolize in black the Chinaman, forgive my 20th century speech, may symbolize in yellow, each has his own tradition. Greek beauty laughs at Coptic beauty and the American Indian derides them both. It is almost impossible to reconcile all tradition, whereas it is by no means impossible to find the justification for every form of beauty that has ever been adored on earth by an examination of the mechanism of aesthetic apprehension, whether it be dressed in red, white, yellow, or black. We have no reason for thinking that the Chinaman has a different system of digestion from that which we have, though our diets are quite dissimilar. The apprehensive faculty must be scrutinized in action. So the fact that McLuhan is, uh, is looking at Joyce and emphasizing this aspect of um, the creation of these beautiful forms in poetry um, and even their destruction, which, which Joyce does all the time. He, he makes these minotaurs and he slays them, uh, as, as McLuhan writes in this very long essay, which everyone here should read. I actually retyped the damn thing and posted it on my Tumblr. Here's a link in the chat. Um, so, um, yes, M what McLuhan zeroed in on here is there's sensible and then there's apprehended. And Joyce called this the moment of epiphany. But uh, in this uh, retracing, he, he, there are all these uh, talk, all this talk of uh, labyrinths. So minotaurs are the sort of lord of the labyrinth, right? Um, so McLuhan really figured himself to be a sort of detective, an aesthetic or sensory mm -hmm. detective to find where these idols mm -hmm. might, might be generated from. So why is this considered beautiful? 
uh, you know, th there's this whole premise that McLuhan challenged that, you know, beauty is some sort of platonic ideal that zaps onto us in the form of Renaissance bust statues or, or whatever, you know, uh, that really these uh, are, should be studied as forms and thus have a formal cause to them. And uh, he took the Aristotelian route in the same way Joyce did, in the same way Aquinas did. So it has to come back to the senses. Why is this beautiful? How did that happen, right? And um, so that's true in poetry, sculpture, any art. And so that's why what McLuhan means by this being a, a process open to discussion or open to reason. So uh, anyway, so what McLuhan is trying to get at here is how, how do our, how does our sight, our smell, our taste, our touch, uh, our, the other one, our hearing, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, how do those relate to these uh, moments of epiphany? How do they relate to what uh, Aristotle calls the nos poeticos, the, or what you might say translates to English as the making mind, the nous, uh, mm -hmm. poeticos. Poeticos means to make. Mm -hmm. um, so as we make sense of the world, uh, how is that done? And so uh, I actually, at the end of this essay, uh, this article, I included a, 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 an added version that McLuhan put 10 years later. Uh, so in 1962, he revisited the same essay and brings it back to, uh, to Aquinas saying, uh, he brings it back to this concept of by making, by constructing, they come to know. So it is in this doing process uh, in which one comes to know something in, in the becoming. So um, that is, it requires action. So, but there's something missing here. Uh, everything that's described as labyrinthine, as uh, w which you know can, can really be taken for the wanderings of, of the brain, uh, being a, a sort of labyrinthine structure itself, complete with minotaurs. I, I don't know how many people here have seen uh, The Shining, or whatever, but there's a whole <laughs> whole aspect there uh, of the the maze and the uh, the axe wielding uh, thing that's guarding knowledge or whatever. But um, the brain. Uh, is treated by St. Thomas in a totally different way that is not mentioned here. And in fact, I took it upon myself not only to study McLuhan, but to uh, see what Joyce thought about all this. So this is also in, in my essay. Um, I found out that like McLuhan, Joyce also liked to handwrite in a lot of his books. And so this is something McLuhan picked up from Joyce. I also found out that uh, James Joyce, being trained as a Jesuit in Ireland, Trinity College, Dublin, um, studied the Jesuit psychology of his time, uh, which would have been uh, Michael Maher. Uh, so again, this I'm framing this all in this larger project to revive St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. And this starts in 1879 in an encyclical called Eterni Patris, uh, promulgated by Pope Leo the Thirteenth. So um, 10, 12 years later, you have Joyce in school and, or even just a few years later, and he has a copy of Michael Maher's psychology. So it has to treat this question of the internal senses because St. Thomas Aquinas treats with the internal senses and that's what's going on. So they have a copy of Joyce's handwritten student book, his textbook at the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas. Um, I called my friend who lives in Austin. Or, or, or by the way, my father's library wound up at, as old books. Oh, wow. Same library. So uh, my buddy, Sam Bridges, I called up, said, Sam, uh, please go to the Harry Ransom Center and look for uh, James Joyce's copy of this book, Psychology. And he pulled it aside and I said, go to this page. He said, it's not there. Oh, it's another edition. So go to this page instead. Mm -hmm. So, um, and in it, uh, there is Aquinas' treatment of the internal senses, but that must not have been covered in the class because there's later, um, a guy named Francisco Suarez was uh, considered to be the Jesuit interpreter of Aquinas. And 
there's a paragraph that says Suarez's doctrine. And it says, there is no real nor formal distinction among the interior senses. So everything that we were talking about happening in the brain of there being a census communis, of there being uh, an imaginative faculty, cogitative and memorative, is all lumped into this one internal sense that does all these things. Um, no real nor formal distinction among them, them just being in one organ, the brain. Um, James Joyce has written next to this paragraph, a question mark. So the, the detective work uh, is there. Um, so that's fun. Uh, and and uh, just heightens the mystery of this stuff. But uh, it is actually not mysterious what happened. There's, there's a whole history there. So, um, but yes, um, that is to say that McLuhan in this essay, it, it shows that uh, he takes the common sense, the census communis as this one faculty, which can be modified by being visual or audio tactile. So he really sums it up into there being like two modes of, of mm -hmm. knowing. Um, and, but what he's really talking about is just the, the imagination. Because as we know, the census communis receives phantasms. Um, it doesn't understand them. So for McLuhan, that gap between the census communis and the intellect is left totally obscure. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, not accounted for. But uh, to bring this back to what we were saying earlier, you might say that the oral world is dominated by that audio tactile sense, or McLuhan might say this. And then he might say, the, uh, as soon as you write it down, you've translated audio tactile space into visual space. Mm -hmm. And then you've made possible Euclid, you've made possible Plato, you made possible all these things which uh, could never exist um, in this other form of knowledge. So let, let me, um, I, I want to do a few things. I mean, this is just so fascinating. So many interesting observations. I want to follow up on some things individually so people get a much clearer idea. Sure. So how does McLuhan apply to the distinction between somebody who has a print sensibility, who's used to reading as a primary means versus somebody who watches TV four hours a day? Uh, what's 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 the difference? Yeah, so <clears throat> the uh, the television thing he called uh, audio tactile. He said, study study the thing, and he actually he made the distinction between film and television. That the TV camera isn't uh, a, a photo camera at all. The TV camera of his time didn't take pictures. It sent scan lines out to be read at a specific frequency and then burst onto you uh, the same way that the light is coming at us um, instead of being projected out. So, um, you know, McLuhan would say that the, the television world is discontinuous, abrupt, ideographic, um, characterized by these juxtapositions that generate meaning. Um, and is the world of slang. He called it a cool medium um, because it involves all of our senses, is totally participatory. Um, it requires your full attention by being such a low definition image that you are active in the making process of these scan lines. Um, this is what McLuhan would say. It's not necessarily what I would say or what Mark would say, but this is how McLuhan framed it. And then versus the print thing, which is totally uh, what he called lineal, uh, you know, you read from left to right or from right to left and page to page, section through subsection, the table of contents and everything is organized in an index. Um, this is the, the real print world was really gone by the time television came onto the scene uh, or even radio. But um, he, he outlined a, a lot of how print transformed scribal um, in his student Walter Ong's work, uh, Ramus and the Decay of Dialogue, in which, you know, the books of the of the scribes did not have elaborate um, tables of contents to them um, in the way that print books did. Uh, 
And so McLuhan often said that uh, the television world is symbolic in a way that, um, you know, this print world never was. And so he held great hope for, um, for a world uh, to sort of, he called it Humpty Dumpty comes back together again without even trying, uh, like in an instant. So um, this fragmented bit by bit thing uh, becomes an, a cosmic egg where everything is unified and, and man becomes uh, uh, a hunter gatherer using everything at, at their disposal to, um, for whatever desired effect they might have. And so, you know, we see this dramatized all the time. And as I said, the, the professor coming in, what's all this then, you know, <laughs> the whole, uh, uh, but McCoo would say, uh, you know, what is the meaning of this? And he said, well, mm -hmm. the meaning of this is, is, the, is a happening. The meaning of meaning is a happening. Um, and so, but again, we're, we're really not there anymore. And so it complicates things um, and it forces the issue of, uh, of, of what's missing. And in, in my essay, I write that uh, McLuhan, if we could characterize his contribution in terms of faculty psychology, what he really, really did was not only bring formal causality back into the picture, but in terms of faculty psychology, he drew an elaborate poetic history of the imagination and how the imagination was transformed in all these different circumstances, how each of these different phantasms hit the person. Um, and, uh, you know, you can take it one step further and say, um, what happened to the other side? <laughs> what happened to the memory? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, what happened to the cogitative? Mm -hmm. uh, which is why by the time McLuhan was writing, uh, you have someone sent calling the cogitative sense a forgotten sense, Julian Paguerre in one of the uh -huh. essays in our, yes. in our journal. And so, that's the one that we are going to go to next week. So right. we will make a full dive into that. I want to hit on one more point, uh, actually two more points. The first one is about uh, McLuhan's laws of media. Yes, yes. very important. So, so go ahead, tell, tell, me, tell, tell people about what, what are these laws of media and how they how do they work in terms of replacement and go ahead so uh McLuhan framed uh so this is the title of a posthumous book laws of media the new science published in 1988 the year I was born mm -hmm. 32 years ago and um McLuhan was toying around with these laws of media starting in the the middle 1970s so after he got very, very famous in the 1960s. And then as of 1970, it was sort of a plane crash and, and nobody wanted to hear McLuhan. So by the time 77 comes along and he's brought out for Annie Hall, it's a, it's a nice nostalgic treat for people who lived 10 years before that. So, um, but what he was doing in that time was um, discussing formal causality uh, with a guy named Fritz Willemson. Uh, of Thomas Professor of Psychology at the uh, University of um, Dallas, and uh, or, or just of philosophy, sorry, um, and trying to get his son Eric uh, his own PhD. So uh, Thomas Eric actually his own PhD through Williamson at the University of Dallas. Um, he also was asked to publish a new version of his most famous book, Understanding Media. And uh, him and Eric were working together and they started to see a pattern. Um, and they started asking these questions that all technologies have these three characteristics to them, all human artifacts. In fact, every word, every piece of art, uh, you can ask these questions. He said, uh, they enhance something or other you know, if every technology is an extension of man, then surely they enhance one faculty or another. Uh, what do they obsolesce or, you know, uh, dim down? That's the second question you can ask. What do they flip into when they're, you know, pushed to their limits? Uh, you know, how do their char characteristics reverse? But then the fourth question didn't come until much later. 
Uh, it took them three, three, I think, days or, or weeks or so. And they, they figured, um, what does it retrieve that had previously been obsolesced? And so McLuhan uh, Marshall in the 70s had these questions, wrote uh, a couple articles about them, uh, one in a journal called ETC, called The Laws of the Media. Um, but uh, at the time in, in 77, he said he actually wanted to call it the phenomenology of the media. And he said, the key to, uh, to phenomenology and the insights of any phenomenologist is that there's a figure ground relationship. Uh, so in Gestalt psychology, you have figure and ground. And he said that the secret to phenomenology is that in any situation, there's always another situation that peeps through. Um, and is Can you explain the, the figure and ground mm -hmm. distinction? Yes. So uh, figure ground is, uh, is seen a lot in the, the sort of illusions made by people. So maybe the most famous one that we would relate to is probably who here remembers the dress? Uh, is it black and blue or is it white and gold? Um, you know, it can be seen both ways, depending on what you're using as the ground. And uh, it requires science to know that the photographer, <laughs> that there is actually a real dress that is a particular color and that the lighting and all these other effects uh, can, can play a role in, in changing that figure or the way it's perceived by us, which is the ultimate mm -hmm. ground, our senses. So um, yeah, you have the, the vase, mm -hmm. Yes. which is the two faces, yep. right? You know, that, that whole thing. Excellent. Yeah. So it depends on what you're using as a, a reference point. Mm -hmm. And uh, McLuhan uh, said, you know, we, we can look at this as a double figure ground, these laws of media, this enhancement, obsolescence, reversal and retrieval, that they're all simultaneous, they occur at once, um, and they can be asked about any human artifact at all. And he said uh, in the introduction to the book, no one's ever come up with a fifth law of media. And if they, if they do, please write to us and, mm -hmm. and we'd love to know about it. Uh, so um, in that book, uh, you know, you, he, he gives multiple examples and, and they're called tetrads for their four part mm -hmm. structure. Uh, this was done in deliberate opposition to the uh, threefold uh, Hegelian structure, uh, which tends to be these things that drive history and generating new things. Um, Andrew McLuhan has just recently found the handwritten note in the back of uh, one of his father's books, uh, who was the uh, main author of the Laws of Media, in which the tetrad and the triad are very specifically uh, contrasted with each other, we're now going to try to work through exactly how uh, Eric saw those things. But it, it was an opposition. Uh, remembering here also that Marshall McLuhan, when he was an uh, undergraduate, um, or, uh, yeah, when he was an undergraduate, he, he got to Cambridge University and they wouldn't uh, admit his Canadian degrees. So he had to first get uh, a, a valid undergraduate degree that's right. Uh, before he went on to get his, his PhD. But it was in that process that he was caught between the communists on the one side, the Marxists. Remember, Cambridge in this time period produced the, the so-called Cambridge Five, the spies who went to work for the Soviet Union, and the Catholic Church, which was represented by uh, Chesterton and Bella. So McLuhan is, is caught in the middle of this, uh, of this conflict that plays out uh, through all of this. So on the one hand, the triad is thought to be the Marxist approach. Um, uh, synthesis uh, is the result of a conflict, a dialectical conflict um, uh, between thesis and antithesis. And so Peter's absolutely correct. McLuhan is, is very deliberately uh, going to a fourfold discussion, not a threefold. Right. And uh... With, with a lot of important implications here, uh, it, back to his, you know, sort of poetic roots that uh, this system, not of logic, but of analogy, analogos, mm -hmm. which means folding the thing back on itself. <clears throat> and uh, 
which the Anna gives him uh, the retrieval bit, which is missing from the uh, from the triad. So it's a matter of seeing something in relation to something else, as opposed to something that generates and produces something new. Um, the thing <laughs> is the thing to be studied, uh, not not something new to be made. You know, and uh, so you can make a tetrad on uh, simply writing. Uh, you can make a tetrad on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. You can make a tetrad for the tetrad and mm -hmm. what the tetrad does. Uh, you know, even McLuhan gave uh, his lecture notes to uh, doctor friends at the University of Toronto and mm -hmm. uh, oncologists were thinking it could be useful in treating cancer uh, or at least asking questions that they wouldn't normally ask about their, um, their uh, you know, plans, experiments, things like this. So... Um, <clears throat> it is uh, a fascinating heuristic, really, which, which is what it is, or a tool for drawing questions and interpreting, for, forcing you to interpret something that you would otherwise ignore, I think. And um, so there are multiple examples in the mm -hmm. book Laws of Media. Mm -hmm. There are also multiple examples recently published in a book of Eric McLuhan called The Lost Tetrads. Mm -hmm. Um, and all this is just a Google search away. So you can just type in Google laws of media PDF and you'll find monoscop.org uh, has uh, all this written out. But um, I don't know if there's been a new publication of laws of media in print, but there hasn't, there should be. And um, maybe they would ask Andrew McLuhan to write a new introduction <laughs> to it. Well, so, well yeah. um, let me ask you one question about the retrieval. Yeah. So it looks like, uh, electric or television, especially, is a retrieval of oral tradition. Is that fair? Totally. Okay. Yeah. So how is it? And the the motto of the center is digital retrieves the scribal. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. Mark, would you like to, to take that one or start with it? And then I can. Yes. Well, it's first. the. Um... The slogan actually of the center is digital retrieves the medieval. Medieval, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so uh, this implies, if this is accurate, this implies that we're, we're actually retrieving not just medieval, but we're retrieving the transition from oral to scribal, mm -hmm. which is Julian James. Mm -hmm. Which is why Julian James, when I met with him, said I would have started with McLuhan as opposed to the rest of this nonsense. Recognizing that. And, and we'll get uh, with Merlin Donald, we'll get another uh, treatment uh, on all of this. Um, the uh, this identification of retrieval uh, of the archaic oral is what uh, Walter on student of Marshall McLuhan's and writing his PhD at Harvard on Peter Ramos, effectively the uh, second volume of Marshall's PhD. He called this secondary orality, not the same, but a retrieved version of it. He then, Walter Ong, suggested that uh, the next step would be a retrieval uh, of uh, literacy. Uh -huh. and tried to promote the notion of secondary literacy following secondary orality in the same historic sequence and got no traction at all. Um, we believe the reason why is because that development requires a new structure for the underlying formal cause. Um, if it was still within the electric environment, that transition could not happen, and in fact did not happen. Here we are, however, with a new technology and a new formal cause, which has a very different underlying structure. And that underlying structure um, of digital is what delivers to us, we believe, uh, secondary literacy, exactly what um, Ong had said. So we're, we're in effect recapitulating um, or re-experiencing um, what happened in the, in, in the 
shift from oral to literacy, which is uh, what James was talking about. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me see. Uh, Peter, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, it's good to, to bring up some examples here. Um, so the Tetrad is meant um, as a sort of an exercise. And, you know, again, they're posed as four questions. You can ask them about anything. And uh, it's not expected that they'll all come at once. Um, you know, you'll have to ruminate on it probably. Uh, asking question like, what does Zoom retrieve? Uh, what does Zoom enhance? What does it obsolesce? What does it flip into when pushed to its limits? It, it requires dialogue. Um, but yeah, so some examples here. There's two um, I wanna point to. Um, there's a tetrad in laws of media for television and one for computer. Um, First, I will, I will mention the computer one because it's mm -hmm. relevant to us today. <clears throat> um, so it's this, uh, this picture. It, it would be good to see it because they, they have a particular way of, of showing it meant so that it's not meant as a linear thing, but I'll just mm -hmm. speak it. So sure. it enhances speeds of calculation and retrieval. Rem remembering that retrieval mm -hmm. is one of the four mm -hmm. <laughs> pieces of the Tetrad, but this is in the enhancement. So it enhances retrieval and speeds of calculation. Um, it obsolesces sequence, approximation, perception, the present. So it's, it's also important to note what the McLuhan's mean by obsolescence. They, they don't mean that it, it's disappeared, but rather that it's, uh, it's no longer the sort of driving force. In fact, an obsolescence, uh, things, They'd say obsolescence never meant the end of anything. Uh, ubiquity is a kind of obsolescence to them. So it's the, the Bob Cratchit uh, bookkeeper, you know, uh, the sort of archivist, me going to the, the Rockefeller archive, the guy pulling up this file from this thing. Um, that's happening all the time. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, then there's the retrieval bit, which they write perfect memory total and exact. Um, so that's some, so something that's key about the retrieval quadrant is in order for something to be retrieved, it had to have been lost before. Mm -hmm. It had to have gone out of style in order for it to come back into style. Um, you know, Twin Peaks fans, you know, that gum you like has come back, is going to come back in style, you know. Uh, it, it implies a, a person Mm -hmm. It implies humanity that has again has imperfect knowledge, imperfect awareness of uh, of whatever configuration. So uh, the thing is brought back into fashion by this uh, this thing. It's been retrieved after having been obsolesced before. Mm -hmm. So then all kinds of questions around. Well, what obsolesced our memory? Mm -hmm. So uh, and then the flip um, says it flips into general systems which was true. Um, and that is uh, anarchy via, via the overlay of bureaucracy, McLuhan writes. Um, so yeah. Uh, that, that would be the uh, Communist Party of China, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> well, then there's uh, the television tetrad too, mm -hmm. which I, I wanna just briefly outline uh, before breakaways, um, which is television. It enhances the multi-sensuous using the eye as hand and ear. So he means visual as audio tactile. Again, this is a sort of what we would view as an incomplete picture of, uh, of the psychology involved, but um, perhaps uh, is answered elsewhere in here in this tetrad. So the obsolescence, it says that obsolescence is a point of view. So the point of view is totally obsolesced. Point of view being a technical term for you know, perspective and painting. Um, suddenly you have pointillism, you have cubism, you have all these, these sculptural forms of art. Um, or, or deconstruction, the, the whole French right. uh, postmodern deconstruction is um, that quadrant of television. Right. And then uh, there's the, it retrieves the occult uh, as McLuhan writes here. One sense through another. He writes, um, 
And, and, and my example there would be LSD. And, <laughs> and it turns out that LSD was enormously significant to the French postmodern. And uh, to further drive home uh, that feeling, uh, reverses uh, into the inner trip, the exchange of inner and outer. Um, so that inner trip is a kind of uh, fantasy quest um, where you make your own sort of uh, networks of internal uh, understanding that become your outer world. And my, um, my example there would be Facebook. Facebook is flip television. It's not digital. It's not perfect memory, total and exact. It has none of, none of the characteristics of the, of the computer tetrad. Um, it is weaponized flip television, which is why it, it now has to obey the rules of television and censor. And uh, the big de debate on television this morning, uh, as I was watching some morning shows, was whether it was appropriate or not to have Facebook ban Donald Trump for his lifetime. Um, uh, we, we will eliminate that inner trip uh, uh, to enhance our own inner trip. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, so folks, this is a very large area we are trying to cover. Okay, and Peter, this was just simply amazing uh, how well, much you, you managed to uh, cover to so here. far. So now comes the main part which is going to be small breakout rooms where we discuss all the ideas presented. Um, again, I've posted the rules uh, for the breakout rooms. Let everybody speak for a couple of minutes on what their big takeaways are uh, and then have a discussion. Uh, and then we're going to come back here and you will get to talk about your very brief takeaways and most importantly, ask questions. Okay, so I'm starting the breakout rooms now. Welcome back folks, welcome back. All right, so now it's time for takeaways and questions. Now, we don't have that much time, so I'm going to prioritize questions. You can give your takeaways, but give, give, give it in like maybe two sentences or three sentences, because I want to get to as many people as possible. Okay. I, um, I see Andrew C. Is that Andrew Crystal? Uh, no, no, sorry. No, no, it's not. It's okay. <laughs> All right, uh, so folks, uh, as always, we have four rules. Number one, type exclamation mark in chat when you want to ask a question or raise your hand in Zoom. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. Number four, feel free, this, feel free to disagree courteously. Uh, so um, Mike, quick question, please. Question only, go ahead, Mike. Uh, Mike go ahead. Question, uh, uh, well, comment first, short. Uh, two the, two we, sentences. Zoom reminds me of the song, Little Boxes on the Hillside, Little Boxes Made of Ticky Tacky. Uh, and they all look just the same. Now, I'd like to map, map, that, map that into the Tetrad for questions and more explanation of how, what's, how much of that is obsolete, because I guess that's before, uh, before uh, the Internet came. Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> Doom and tetrad. Okay, I, I'm I'm not quite sure how to respond, but I would say, uh, you know, tetrads. Uh, sorry, Zoom. Uh, I'm not gonna speed running a tetrad is, is gonna be tough here, but because um, I'd actually have to sit down and think about it. But I'd say off the top of the top of the dome, Zoom obviously enhances uh, teleconferencing, um, but it also enhances uh, privacy and passwords. Uh, it obsolesces these uh, needless flights to uh, have tiny chats, right? Um, and then it retrieves, I suppose, a kind of um, more symposium structure, uh, maybe the sort of conferences that can happen on more specialized topics. Uh, and it flips into all day, every day, living in a in a Ethernet, uh, you know, pipe somewhere, uh, you know. No fun at all. <laughs> Just carnation, I would say it flips into, perhaps. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, folks- Keeping in uh, mind that they can be recorded and uh, things like this. So it, it, there's also the digital thing to it. So it retrieves it. Uh, and I'd imagine uh, that these things can be transcribed into text as well. And someday someone somewhere will probably take all the Zooms, put them in just text format and uh, they'll be only about a gigabyte large. 
Wonderful. I think the CIA has been doing that for us. NSA and the CIA have been. Uh, just a second, Mike. Mike, let's not go back and forth. Let's let's get people as many people. See, uh, Peter, Mike is our resident historian. If I let him speak, he can speak for two hours continuously <laughs> without a pause. Uh, ne next up is uh, Stefan. Stefan, go ahead. What's your question? Take away and question. Um, yeah, I was just thinking that maybe Zoom would possibly slightly reconfigure one of our oldest communication forms, which is reading each other's body language, because we still see each other's faces and shoulders, but two thirds of our body are no longer seen. So if we persisted in, I mean, this will probably take a long time, right? But I'm thinking it could uh, possibly yeah. change over time. People are not meant to be, uh, let's say one inch large, I think. <laughs> I think the, mm -hmm. the definition, we demand much more. Uh, in fact, Mark has a particular smell to him as people who have met him can attest. Uh, my, my dog met him the first time uh, last week. So smells can tell you things. Uh, obviously, ticks can tell you things. And I don't know if you can see a tick at 300 pixels. Maybe you can, I don't know. Um, folks, uh, you can go ahead and type exclamation mark to uh, line up. I just want to say that what we are doing here is enormously ambitious. Okay, what we're trying to do is we are trying to look at what modern intellectuals, as well as the modern culture, has thought about human beings, which is a very narrowed sense of what human being is. And we are trying to broaden it. We are trying to take in Aristotle, you know, not, you know, Aristotle on his soul. And what I'm realizing is that uh, poetics is also a very crucial part of it because there is a lot of aesthetic sense that is integral to how we operate. Um, Aquinas is the great integrator. You know, he's, he's put all of these things together. Every time I read anything about him or by him, you know, it just blows me away. So we have all of that. And so we're trying to get to that. It is enormously difficult because not because it is what we are saying is difficult to absorb, but because what you have to unlearn that is stopping you from seeing things <laughs> is difficult to get rid of. So it's, it's, it's a question of kind of removing things from, from your stack so you can actually look at yourself. And what is being said is actually quite simple. It is just about who we are and what we do. Um, all right, so next up is going to be uh, Joe and Gene. Joe. I'll just make one quick comment that um, we're fortunate enough to have Peter in our breakout room, but the idea of using the Tetrad as a compass um, to, man to understand all types of transformations, not just ones particular to media and you know anything that's a human artifact. Uh, so that was one interesting, you know, takeaway that uh, we had had in our breakout room that I just wanted to share with everyone. I have a lot of questions, but probably we're out of time. Sorry. So. All right. Uh, if you think of one question you would like to ask, ask later on, you can just go ahead and I'll, I'll put you in line again. Uh, next up is Gene. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. Joe. Well, I mean, there was something about how the orals and uh, um, the electronic and digital and how we understand boundaries within these constructs. And I wasn't really sure, like we use specific techniques was mentioned. And I wasn't sure what that what you meant by techniques, if that's, if you're able to answer that in a minute, to understand boundaries within these four uh, mediums. Mark is uh, muted. Uh, Mark, you need to unmute yourself. If you're trying to speak, where is Mark? Yeah, I think Mark is. Uh, uh, Joe, one of the more obvious uh, aspects of this is the relationship between imagination and memory and uh, what, what is being enhanced. And so the, the boundaries are, are not uh, uh, drawn hard, but rather as a, as a more matter of emphasis balance within a larger matrix. We, next week, when we uh, zero in on the cogitative sense, which is where patterns are recognized and, and so forth. Um, if you're able to come next week, we'll, we'll talk more about that, that distinction and, and what, the, um, what, what boundaries uh, arise as a result. Next up is Jean from Hawaii. 
Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, was, uh, I have a question as an architect. I really see the danger of this digital world, how the impact of the social structure of the city, you know, and in this, like in the Italy, the beauty of the city, they have this small gathering space that's create all the interaction, the random interaction of people. And it's, it's create all this, you know, it's fun and culture. Then we have Starbucks here, supposed to be the people gathering. Now everybody's sitting there with their own screen. There's nobody talk. And my idea interaction as I actually Zoom provides something. I wonder, is that possible? I actually have this idea about internet cafe. So we have the, I think the beauty of the internet, it can connect to people who have same interest, like the people here. But is it possible when we find those people, then we actually put them together. Then they actually have more interaction with, you know, three dimensional, you know, all the, then that's can have deeper communication. I think that's why I have, I have this idea of internet cafe together people with different topic interests, then they go to the cafe, they actually see each other, they actually interact with each other. So they actually enhance the city. So it's actually a tool on top of additional traditional way of city. But I see nothing, nothing is happening. They just disappear, you know, all these interaction plays are disappeared. Instead, replaced by the internet, but it cannot be replaced physically. Yeah, <clears throat> I would say uh, Starbucks um, is like one of many uh, inter multi-international <laughs> companies that, are, uh, that create the illusion of being the same space by having a logo and having a set architecture as if they were making a seance to bring the spirit of Starbucks somewhere. Um, you know, making sure they have the right music playing and, and making it feel like you're at Starbucks, whether you're in Texas or you're in Alaska or in Moscow. Um, that is a kind of fantasy that um, will no longer, we won't, simply won't allow it to, to uh, continue. Um, we, Think we sense differently now, and uh, I think what you're feeling is is a, is a widespread feeling that we really need to remember how to be human, and there is not just one way. There are many, many, many ways that that is done, um, and they're all being retrieved right now. Um, Mark, do you have something to say about that? That yeah, tension? one thing we haven't emphasized enough, and and I, I think Bill may criticize me um, for this at some point. Is, uh, and it, it, it's partly uh, because of the way uh, Srikant has organized this with, uh, with all of his friends here. But we haven't talked about the robots. That's right. And, um, and, and so the, the simple answer to your question, Jane, is that um, half the people being born today will never have a job. Never. So they will be taken care of, they will get payments from governments, all kinds of silly things will happen. But the net of it, they're gonna have a lot of time on their hands. And so I'll recommend a book here to you. The title of it is Leisure, The Basis of Culture. What's gonna happen here is people are gonna wind up with a lot of time to create culture. And this is already happening in all sorts of places. Peter's more involved with it probably than I am. But one of the effects of the robots taking our jobs is that we're now going to be free uh, to be much more culturally uh, advantaged with each other. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is, uh, you know, let me see. Uh, Laura asks, cell phone changed the culture in some positive ways, but it will also have negative impact on learners today. So any comments on what cell phones have done? Yeah, um, I think, um, th thank you, Laura. Um, so uh, in an interview McLuhan gave uh, with Bruce Powers near the end of his life, he wrote, uh, every, every media has services and disservices. So it's quite obvious to see the disservices of cell phone, um, but some of the services that it, that it does provide um, is really uh, what it can do for memory. Um, there, there are ways to use it, uh, and rather um, aspects of it, which can create a sort of uh, encyclopedic effect. Um, you know, part, part of that is what's happening here, um, this sort of book group situation. Um, 
And, you know, I'd imagine there's lots of efforts like this going on. Um, and I'd say that they wouldn't have been possible uh, even 20 years ago, maybe. This is the Library of Alexandria. This, this is literally everything that anybody has ever thought. If we start thinking about this, not as a fantasy machine, but a memory machine, um, we wind up with very different results. Um, Peter and Mark, I want to show you something. Um, right next to my uh, apartment where I used to live was the Sony Museum of Media. And they had- Wow, this, I want to check that out. Yeah, <laughs> Where is no, that? It, it's no longer there, unfortunately. Oh, no. But so they had this entire giant wall where they traced the history of media. Uh, mm -hmm. And they actually had artifacts like the older, oldest telephones to the newest telephones, yeah. oldest movie cameras to the newest camp. So every media. And I looked at it one day. I was going, I, it's one of my favorite places. I, I went there and I realized, I had this realization, all of those things are here. Right. We have all access to all of it here. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing uh, stuff. Uh, okay. Next up is going to be Jonathan. Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, just a quick comment. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I was really jazzed when I saw this uh, topic today because um, um, I sort of, I read a book of McLuhan for a course and rhetoric a while ago and it just sort of changed my perception. And I think one of the profound things about McLuhan and this whole idea of, you know, uh, how we perceive things, imbues them with meaning is the fact that it's so paradigm shifting. And one of the things I noticed, and actually in the breakout room, the question I have is basically, when we have operating assumptions, we have sort of paradigms we operate under, right? Rational paradigms, we just sort of adopt them. You know, democracy is good as one. When people question that, there's a sense of uneasiness. There's sort of a sense of apprehension, I think, yeah. um, like you had mentioned. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's, it's, it passes and we wanna accept it. Other times we don't wanna accept it, but it's sort of like this inner chaos that sort of springs up almost like a black hole almost. And we, we sort of are almost resistant to it just instinctively. And yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. so I, I would say that, uh, first of all, thank you, Jonathan. And it's uh, people stake their identities in these things big time. They become the environment. And when the environment goes away and a new one comes in, people lose their identities or they feel as if the ground has been cut from underneath them. And uh, that's sort of the story of violence. You know, people get enormously violent when they feel that their identity is being threatened. So people will, uh, when they have so much of a stake in, in a certain way of doing things, in a certain particular paradigm, in a particular environment, they'll, they'll be very hostile to the, to the thought that things don't work that way anymore. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it can be volatile and these transitions really need to be eased. And in fact, we can take for certain that even though our paradigm has changed, uh, people will be talking about the contemporary art that's pushing boundaries today, a hundred years from now, <laughs> some people will just be catching up. And, uh, you know, McLuhan liked to say that the artists are a, early warning system, uh, the dew line um, that, that gets there 60 years before uh, any of the educational bureaucracies can touch it. Thank you. Uh, in, next, in this regard, um, I will point you to uh, a book that I know for sure was written by Marshall McLuhan, because I know that <laughs> civic history, War and Peace in the Global Village. Yes, yes. In which, in which he describes this, and I will then simply say, we have at times introduced the Center for the Study of Digital Life as um, the primary organization trying to uh, avoid World War III. Um, th this um, shift in paradigms and the identity crisis that it produces must produce violence. And one of our primary objectives is to do our best to avoid um, the most dangerous of those sorts of violence. Wonderful. Next up is uh, Stefan, followed by L. Stefan, what's your question? 
Well, I did have another question, but now I'm very curious about what Mark just said. Why must it incite violence? For just the reason that, that Peter said, if, if your identity, or as McLuhan describes it in some detail, if you feel like your identity is threatened, this actually reduces you to a, a very uh, bestial uh, sort of uh, fight or flight uh, kind of a reaction. And it's the fight side of that uh, identity threatening shift um, that we're very concerned about, particularly in, in terms of uh, conflicts between uh, China and the US. Wonderful. Our next question is uh, L. L, what's your question? Hi, my name is L or Ellen. Um, my question is how likely or probable is it that half of all persons, as you say, who, are, who ha will be born will not work? Um, um, do you have a referent for that, please? Um, yes, the, the, the two primary organizations, actually three, that have all come to the same conclusion. It started at uh, um, Oxford. Um, so there's something called the Martin School at Oxford. Uh, and they produced a study about five years ago. Then McKinsey has something, the McKinsey Global Institute. They produced, came at it a whole different direction. They came up with the same conclusions. And then MIT did the same sort of thing. And uh, the guy who did that is now at Stanford. But we've been through five years worth of multiple independent organizations all coming to the same conclusion. Wonderful. Um, all right, so let me do one thing. Uh, Stefan, if you have a quick Mark? question, you can go ahead. Uh, Elle, you have a quick follow-up? Yeah, I do. Um, is there, so we, we probably won't have a paradigm shift that will not have that happen. Um, my question is how hardwired is the human brain, particularly the male human brain uh, for war and, and, and doing that behavior. And thank you, Mark and Shrikant. Thanks, El. Um, plasticity is uh, a topic that has gr been greatly explored over the course of the past 20 years. Um, but it is our view that, uh, uh, as Peter said, um, once you've learned English, you've learned probably more than you'll learn the rest of your life. These things happen quite early. Uh, and so uh, many people who've tried in the 20th century to deal with this, they want to control education. They want to control elementary education in particular. Uh, and so grammar school is that time period in our lives where we sort out these structures. If the grammar school curriculum does not address these questions, L, uh, I suspect we're in for a lot of trouble. Thank you, Mark. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, okay, we got it's about 2.14, so we need to start wrapping up. So I want to give you a preview of the next, next Sunday, because I think that is the most important, um, you know, important meetup or important topic, and that is the cogitative sense of Thomas Aquinas. Um, so let's talk, let's, uh, I'm going to give chance for Mark and Peter to just introduce what the cogitative sense is and why is it important? The most important is why is it important? What I've done is that I've tried to uh, excerpt from the conclusions of the essay. It's a long essay, about 36 pages, but I've tried to ex excerpt from that. Um, I encourage you to read the essay. Um, I also encourage you to read the summary that I've, I've put. It's just a few sentences that gives you a sense of how big the issue is, okay? How crucial this issue is. And then what we will be doing is that we will be giving you an introduction. If you can read the whole thing and come, that's ideal. But if not, you can, we'll give you an uh, introduction and then you go and read it, um, okay? And we'll give you additional resources as well. So Mark and Peter, uh, could you give a, quick preview of the cogitative sense and why it is important. Rene Descartes, um, for those of you who have uh, paid attention, a very important historic philosophical figure, but believed that the pituitary gland was our third eye. The pineal, I think you mean, right? 
Uh, pineal gland, right. Uh, the third eye, l l located, uh, not pituitary, right, the, the pineal gland. Now, um, I don't know that anybody's ever figured out where he got that crazy idea, um, <laughs> except to say that uh, he was trained at a Jesuit school and would have known about faculty psychology. So the cogito ergo sum and all that followed that, the print uh, view of this, was based on there's something hidden inside of our brain that is, that is really where everything comes together, where the animal part of us, where the intellectual part of us, where the emotional, where the will, uh, where uh, desires, there is a, uh, there's a pivot point, there's a nexus for that. And that is identified as the cogitative sense and we'll be describing it in some detail next week. Peter? Yeah, I would say um, it's quite easy to, to wonder and imply what the imaginative power might do. It's also kind of simple to propose what the memorative power might do um, when we're talking about these four interior senses. The ones that are not quite obvious are the sensus communis, which we've really been talking about today with this McLuhan discussion. And even more uh, crucial, as you are talking about, is the cogitative faculty. So this, this cogitative faculty sits really in the middle of imagination, not just imagination and memory, but uh, the sensing human and the intellect. It is called the, uh, by the people who wrote about it, um, to be the highest sense in human beings. Um, they wrote that animals uh, had a similar sense called the estimative sense that does not touch intellect, uh, animals having no intellect, um, but accounts for um, what they find pleasing and displeasing. So the whole range of human experience is then opened up when the intellect touches that. What we find pleasing and displeasing, noxious or beneficial, um, it, uh, it is, as Mark said, quite plastic. And all of these transformations that we're talking about in society, through media, uh, through writing and reading, through speaking and gesture, um, they are brought to bear, physically speaking, on the cogitative power. And very, very, I'd say, you could count them on two hands, uh, people in the 20th century even knew about it. Wonderful. Um, I'm putting in, I've put in the uh, URL over there for the meetup. So go ahead and RSVP there. There's also a link to the essay that we'll be using as well as a short description. Uh, so look forward to seeing you next time. Peter, this was a great honor and simply delightful. <laughs> Just, we, we managed to cover so much. I was scared, you know, how are we going to cover <laughs> McLuhan and cover his approach to inner senses. But I think we, we did a good job of giving a good overview, a good starting point. Uh, ultimately, everybody has to learn on their own, but I think we've given people enough pieces that they can use uh, and enough reasons to go ahead and dive into McLuhan. Well, thank you so much for having me, Srikant. This is really the first time I've ever done anything like this for a group of people. So I thank everyone for being patient with me and uh, if anyone watching this on YouTube wants to send me an email, go to peter.berkman at gmail.com. Who knows? I might sure. even answer it. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Uh, and thank you very much, Mark. Delight. Uh, glad you could take the time off to, to do this. Really appreciate that, doing it in the middle of the vacation. Thank you. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.